Eliza and Ben were thrilled to be getting married. The road to finding each other had been long and fraught with peaks and valleys. If being honest, each of them was surprised that the other was the one, because they could not be more different in their upbringing or in their current lives. Religion, politics, socioeconomics, education, etc. The list of differences went on and on. And yet, their ability to see those differences as positives rather than negatives strengthened their relationship. But now for the wedding planning. With religion and politics being passionate subjects for each side of the aisle, how would these vastly different families handle the big day? From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Bowman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about tribalism, how and why we divide ourselves along political and cultural fault lines. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of Eliza and Ben. After going through a history of tribalism, getting quizzed, and discussing the psychology of tribalism, you'll hear the rest of their story. So fights, you know, with tribalism, mm. a lot of uh, the way we divide ourselves into tribes have has to do with political viewpoints. And that's um, the first thing that came into my head right. when we started talking about this. So just, you know, I'm just curious, like, what, what's, what's sort of been your political journey with your okay, values? Okay, so I think an interesting thing to know is that I did not vote in a presidential election until I was in my mid-20s because my father had a very unique job which tied itself to the political landscape. And so we were very apolitical. We didn't talk about, like it just was not a subject matter. Um, It was actually something that we, not like avoided, like it wasn't a taboo subject, but it was more about like if, if you were voting for your boss, what would that look like? So we, we just, we didn't really talk about it. So I think though, what's interesting is that the older I get, the more attention that I pay and the more passionate I become. So I guess you would say I was a late bloomer Mm -hmm. in the political landscape and, and it's become more and more meaningful and yet more and more disheartening. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you started. How was I? How about you? Well, but it is interesting that you started from a sort of a neutral place. Mm -hmm. Um, my so growing up, I would classify my family as moderate conservatives. Okay, um, mostly voting Republican, but this is back in the era of like Reagan. Yeah, and yeah, Ford. yeah. This is not. This is not um, current you know, climate. Yeah, not extreme by any stretch. But um, I really drifted left when I got to college. Mm. And which you know, I guess that happens. I was going to say, look at that yeah. stereotype. Yeah. So, um, but you know, like my, my family, like we were gun owners. Okay. Uh, this is this is Montana. Yep. yep. Uh, tends to be a you know a, a, a conservative region of the country, but then I came you know East Coast, small liberal arts school, got a big dose of progressivism and liberalism. So I. But I'm glad that I have roots mm-hmm. in that because one of the things we're going to talk about is how important it is to take the perspective of the other side of okay. whatever whatever tribe you're in to take the perspective of, of people in, in other tribes. And I think that's a great time for us to say that there are going to be moments today during this podcast that we talk about difficult subject matter. Yes. And that I think you and I can both say – Proudly, I would say proudly, that we are very intentional about being trying to be as non-judgmental human beings as we possibly can be as we interact, um, but that we do have our own values, but that I think one of the things that we need to get better at as a society is that we can talk about hard things and have it not be disrespectful or not have anybody walk away feeling judged or like they're less than. So I hope that you and I today can can really delve into some of this hard stuff, but that it can be pleasant. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think w- when we bring in politics and and really um, tough values that Religion. we're not we're not we're not preaching. No. Yeah. So we're going to talk about our values more to illustrate some some mental health and psychological concepts that are really important 
for people to think about when it comes to, to tribalism. Yes. So, all right, why don't we define tribalism? Okay. And I think people have a, a certain sense of what it's, what it's all about. But uh, tribalism is a social division in a society consisting of families or communities linked by social, economic, religious, or blood ties mm. with a common culture and maybe dialect, broadly, broadly defined. Could be, just be like vocabulary. What's up, Bronx? <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's typically a recognized leader of a tribe, but that's not always the case. There's yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking of a bunch of tribes that like technically don't, but I yeah for sure this yeah. is uh, such a yeah so such maybe, a hard maybe thing to define. sometimes there's a defined yeah sometimes leader. there's a defined leader. tribalism and the word tribe appears to be a concept that was invented by Europeans <laughs> the first squatters and yeah. Americans in pursuit of colonization who could not find another word to describe societies that differed from their own faith morality way of living etc. Yeah, and so especially when you get in the timeline, we'll, we'll find out that, that that the concept of tribe and tribalism was it, it served a political end. Right. That was I not mean, we needed a way to describe the people positive. that were already here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. For sure. So tribalism uh, is a concept that is hung on throughout uh-huh. our history, particularly in the 20th century, when describing possible causes, causes and issues following World War One and World War Two. Uh. Boy, World War Two. Yeah. Oh. It, and. <laughs> There's there's a link between tribalism and this denigration of the other. I was going to say the dehumanization mm-hmm. that was the beginning of or the foundations of the Nazi regime, right? Okay. Now, tribalism is entrenched within society as a way of describing political differences, particularly within America, which I know we're going to talk about this later, but I think it's so interesting that as part of the definition, it's rooted in differences, like, right. as opposed to things that unite us, it describes right. the things that then divide us, which, I mean, I, you know, I won't go too far ahead, but I mean, I love some of the work that Brene Brown has done and this idea of if we unify ourselves based on shared hate and our differences, right. like this could be where things societally really begin to fall apart. Now, before we're going to get into the, the timeline in just a moment, but, but I think it's, I think it's worth noting that there is not consensus in the science about what causes tribalism. Is it, is it more nature or nurture? And that's, that's, that's the age-old question of psychology. Is it nature or is it nurture? Na- by nature, we, meaning are we programmed genetically to be a certain way or to have certain characteristics versus nurture, which is all mm-hmm. about environment. our experience, yeah. environment, upbringing, social factors. And so there, there are those that argue that there are things about the human brain that wire us, predispose us to getting into groups. And then there are other people that say, no, 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 it's about social factors. It's about having a lot of people together and influencing each other. And and now we have cultural factors as well. Which is why I think, because as I was listening to you talk, I think this is why I personally ascribe and I'm way more comfortable with the biosocial theory, which puts mm-hmm. those two things together. Because in my head, I'm going, well, if we go all the way back to caveman days, which is where we started, yes, we've evolved a whole lot, but ascribing to a tribe meant you were safe. So it's rooted in this idea of survival. And if I'm within a community, I'm way more safe. I'm way more likely to survive. So I get that hardwiring and that our brains, although we've gotten like way more fancy and like the primate part of our brain, but that fundamentally we're still sort of the same. But that this idea of social influence having such a huge piece of that. So I don't think you can separate those two things because even if, for example, your political landscape changed so much, you're still ascribing to something that allows you to be a part of for that sake of protection. It shifted. So now the nurture, I guess, part of it, what's fed into you societally has allowed that to shift, but you're still a part of something. So it's always both. Yes, and so rather, and, and, and the phrase is usually instead of nature versus nurture, it's nature and nurture. Yeah. How do those two things interplay? Love it. All right, so timeline. And shout out to Stuart, Ber- Stuart Berger, our intern who researched this topic for us. The word tribe was used to describe everything from the Sioux of North America to the Germanic and Turkic groups who invaded the Roman Empire. And so, and we mentioned this before, Europeans turned to the word tribe to describe the varying societies they found as they colonized Africa 
in the late 19th century, so we're talking about the 1800s here, okay. tribalism became a basis for the opinion that Africans were not ready to govern themselves. So that here's that dehumanization, the denigration, mm -hmm. the other, mm -hmm. the Africans can't take care of themselves because they belong to this tribe, tribe. so they need Europeans to come in, colonize, uh, missionaries, whatever, to, to take over. So the word has root in less than. Yes. Yeah. Tribalism became a key element of political conversations regarding the Jews and their practice of Judaism, who were criticized by European and North Americans for being tribal. So here, yeah, here we're, we're about yep. over 100 years ago, and that, that word has a negative connotation. If oh. you're tribal, you're not civilized. You, you're not, your thinking is, is not up to par with standards, with societal standards. Right. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of prejudice oh. there. Mm -hmm. So by the turn of the 20th century... So we're going from into the 1900s here. Tribalism became a slur rather than a concept. Mm -hmm. Describing a group as tribal was to criticize it for refusing to assimilate into broader social structures. And this is really important when we think about all the immigration that took right. place at that time. Right. So attempts to retain tribal identities after colonization was seen as proof of intellectual inferiority or moral ignorance. Do you find yourself getting angry as you I read know. this? It's I am get, like, I'm getting hot. My hair is on fire. Okay. Deep breaths. Much of the blame for World War I fell on European nationalism, which was seen as a renewal of tribalism. Okay, now we're going to jump several decades, but this is not to say that <laughs> nothing happened in there. But in 1971, mm. questions started to arise around the origin and ethics behind tribalism. So finally, some Somebody sanity. Somebody paid attention? Yeah. So, for example, some individuals started to believe that European colonialism reconstructed the African reality viewing their societies as particularly tribal. So there was a, a, a re realization there that something was wrong with the thinking. This has begged the question of whether African societies would be regarded as such if African history had not been written by Europeans. I think we can settle that question. Yeah, we'll go with... Definitively? Yeah. Yes. Since about 2015, the concept of tribalism has drawn a lot of heat because of how tribal identity can foster such negative feelings, even hatred toward those outside the tribe. Right. Now, a 2018 article from The New Yorker by George Packer offers interesting insights into tribalism. One quote, quote, we live in a time of tribes, not of ideologies, parties, or groups of beliefs. American politics today requires a word as primal as tribe to get at the blind allegiances and huge passions of partisan affiliation. Tribes demand loyalty, and in return, they confer the security of belonging. Tribes are badges of identity, not a thought. In a way, they make thinking unnecessary because they do it for you. Now, oh man, <laughs> a, lot, a lot there to, to think about. Oh. You know, um, the first presidential presidential election that I remember there being discussion of red states versus blue states mm -hmm. is 2000. Now I'm not saying that that was the first, but that was the first time I, I remember it. This is terrible. Is that Clinton? Or that, is that the been, first Obama? That no, that would have been Bush Gore. Bush Gore. Oh, whoa, now, whoa, 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 okay. So. Terrible. And, you know, I'm pretty sure the whole blue state, red state thing, that just started because networks used one oh, color for one party and one color for the other. It started out, but I think this is, I mean, you may be getting on something interesting. I mean, I think it it started out as just a way to visually identify exactly. something. Who was winning what state? Right. But I, I, the thing that jumps out at me, this quote, and I know we're not quite done with our timeline, but I don't think we can underestimate the hardwired brain neuroscience of belonging. And, you, you know, this is going to be your wheelhouse a little bit more than mine, although my trauma background recognizes a lot of how this fits into stuff. But we are fundamentally wired for connection and belonging. Like human beings need to be connected to other human beings for survival purposes. And this isn't about introvert versus extrovert, but, like, if you look at, the rise of depression within our society, it positively correlates, so matches, boop, they both go up as we look at the disconnectedness that has begun to happen, right? You can work from home, you can shop from home, so like you can get all your clothes, all your groceries, you can technically never leave the house. And then we've also become way more factioned, like are you in my tribe, or are you not in my tribe? And if you look at all this stuff and then the rise of depression, it's scary. It's so, like, so you're kind of you're, you're you're linking up three factors there, which is really interesting. So we become more individual, 
in terms of like human contact because we could do so much more online, whatever. And so is that driving a need to belong to tribes that are more virtual, mm -hmm. red state, blue state, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, religion, and then, but as, as a need to connect, as a way to connect, but then the third factor there is that it's not doing any good. No. Because if you look at the mental health statistics, we are It's actually suffering. getting, it's getting, I, I mean, I don't want to be melodramatic and be like, it's getting worse, but I mean, it is. There is a positive rise in anxiety and depression, and you can see it significantly in our youth. And I mean, right. I think if we really wanted to go down a rabbit hole, which we're not going to go down today, it's also that social media component where people are spending so much less time connecting with one another. Like, I don't go meet you for lunch or breakfast. We can just like FaceTime or I can just Snapchat you right. for hours. And and folks listening who want to hear more discussion about social media, we have an episode. We do. Go to Gosh, social media look at friend that. or foe. Shameless plug. Exactly. So so in one last point about red state, blue state is is I think um, that classification, we've lost nuance. Oh, yeah. Because where do independents show up on there? Where do – I mean, I guess we've introduced purple state, which is kind of lame, but we've lost this whole – idea of diversity in our political discourse. What, what I just it? got purple. I was like, purple. Where is it coming like, with oh, purple? Red and blue. Technically violet, if you really want it. But I think you're right. Like, And I think that that's part of the problem. And as you and I were even discussing this, like, part of my visceral reaction to the idea of tribe is that I think it overgeneralizes. Right. Right? So here's another quote from Packer in that New Yorker article that we really liked. Many believe that everything about American politics today is entrenched in tribalism. Different tribes include, but are not limited to, progressive activists, traditional liberals, passive liberals, politically disengaged, moderates, traditional conservatives, and devoted conservatives. Now, what's really key about that quote is it describes the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So You go from one side to the other. Exactly. It's not, tribalism is not relegated to just one end of the spectrum or the other. It's not just mm -hmm. that, that one group is being tribal. There's a lot of tribe. There's plenty of tribalism to go around. Oh, you can find your tribe. A recent study showed that 77% of Americans believe our differences are not so great that we cannot come together. So there's hope. Oh, gosh. Even I though America know. is polarized along fault lines deeper than political opinions and disagreements mm. over policy, we can swing this pendulum away from tribalism. So we're going to have more thoughts about that. we got a quiz coming up on the other side. Joining us once again is our quiz maestro, master extraordinaire, Mara Teal. Whoop, whoop. Hey. We are so glad I'm she's back. back. <laughs> Very sick. Mara is a therapist, writer, and mom, and that's why you were gone, right? Your family's gotten bigger. Whoop, yep. Whoop. Got another little baby boy. Pretty great. We love the boy. And um, and he, you said he, he almost slept through the night. Yes, so but, close. But yet you felt the need to consume some... <laughs> coffee y'all i'm buzzed it is <laughs> and how much coffee did you have it's like a half a cup i like don't have coffee i my brain is kind of all over the place so just we don't really know what's about to happen it's but. gonna it's gonna make for a great podcast yeah, it'll I be think. great yeah your, your state <laughs> <laughs> our quiz master is high yes on caffeine so what what's going what do you have for us today all right guys um changing up a little bit today so Okay, Craig fights. Both of you provided Brandon with a selection of communities, groups, tribes that you have mm. been a part of either previously or are currently okay. in, involved with. Um, so fights, you gave your list. Craig, you gave your list. So from those lists, basically, Craig, I'm going to give you the list of, of fights' groups. Fights? Is that what we say? I, am I a plural? Are you? Do, we, fights is do we still just say fights? Because you would just be an apostrophe after the S. So it's still fights. fights. Got it. Okay, so. I am so, a third out. of fights. <laughs> Very simple possessive form. You know. Okay. Anyway. Um, so, Craig, you're going to get the list of fights. You are buzzed, Mara. Thank you. Is... y'all. <laughs> She's looking at her. She's checking her heart. Really, She's like, you take are the pulse. Like bonkers. This is like, my lower jaw is warm and buzzing. That feels weird. <laughs> Okay, dude, and I'm over here being like, job well done. So glad. It's only, it's before noon. I'm so, I feel like I've raised for, her ooh. right. For those of you okay. who are just listening to this episode, <laughs> you must go to YouTube and get a visual. Yeah, I don't know what's Probably happening. Probably only because Mara's always like, yeah. put together, take, just, rained it all in. I'm mellow. So this is me buzzed. Anyway, okay, so what am I saying? Craig, you're going to get a list of fights, 
list of tribes. Okay. And you're going to pick which one she most identifies as like a true tribe. So we're going to kind of rank. Yes. All right. You're, you're picking one. You're picking Just one. Just one. Oh, my yes. top. All right. And then, yes. But what if I don't know what it is? Okay, And then going. fights, you're going to do the same for Craigslist. Right on. Craigslist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, up, Shane? <laughs> okay. Um, and so, sorry, y'all. Um, so then, and you guys are going to score each other. So I'm sitting this one out. You get to give fights a score based on her answer for All right. you. Okay. And vice versa. Okay. Right. Makes sense? Mm-hmm. We got and, the rules. And I, we're going to have Oh, honor. yes. Between the two, uh, you are trustworthy. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. So fights. Mm-hmm. We're going to start with you. Oh, okay. So I'm ranking him. You're, or picking you're giving one. Okay. So you're picking which which is the one that he most considers to really be like that tribal Okay. You know, community. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh my this is hard. All right. So Craig was um in the Cub Scouts from first grade through fifth grade. So that's one. Um on the varsity basketball team in high school, obviously. Um still is. You know. Yeah. Um, on he's also on a varsity rowing team in college and is the founder of the Beer Snob Society. They talk about beer. Legit. So you get to pick. And so I just want to clarify the one that he felt like was the most community oriented or is what is the most important to him now? So what is the one that Craig would say is the most tribal and why? Oh. Okay, so, and this is the downside of being a clinician is that we can see so many perspectives all at once. Like my brain is going bing, 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 bing. So, 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 so to recap, so it was uh, well, it's Cub Scouts, Cub Scouts, Scouts, varsity Scouts. basketball, varsity Scouts. rowing, and then and then beer snob. Right. Beer snob so, so here's my conundrum. So I'm going to give a little bit of my thought process, and then I'm going to land on one. So the Cub Scouts would, by definition of like what we just described as tribalism, would probably be to me the closest that ascribes to a tribe, right? That is very much about like this is who we are, and the rest of y'all are not Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts or whatever. But I'm envisioning, I mean, college sports, especially varsity college sports, is all-consuming. I mean, it dictates so much of your schedule. It probably defined a lot of your social group in college. So I'm like, but then which one do you see as the most tribal? May I add some information here that will either help you or muddy the waters? Okay. It would be fun. So... For for high school, well, let's just go through. So, so Cub Scouts, um, by virtue of being a male, I I, I was in. All right, okay. there was no like criteria to to be you know just it was offered and I could do it. High school varsity basketball, I had to try out. Oh yeah, and I had to make it. Um, college rowing, anybody could be on the team, but there was competition to make the top boats. Right. So um, so there was. Like you had, like you know. So I was on the varsity boat, which was the top eight. So that was competitive. Um, and beer stomp society, there's you just have to like. I, I have to have a relationship with you, and you have to like beer. So snob is is not technically a piece. of It's that. snob in that it's not sno- it's snob in that we don't like Coors Light crap beer. Yes, cra- <laughs> yeah. Coors Light is which, an example. Being the one beer that I can drink, having a hops allergy, which means I can't drink beer. I can actually mm. drink Coors Light. Defer from that, what you will. Watch your language. Please. I know. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know if that helps or not, but interesting to think about. You did totally muddy the waters. I'm going to go with then varsity basketball because if you had to try out, so it had this like super, which was not either one of my answers out of the gate, but then I guess, oh, I don't like this because I want to be right. I'm going to go varsity basketball, then. You should varsity. Have to pick one. Oh, I just have to pick just one. Pick I thought one. I had to rank them. Okay, yeah. varsity basketball. Yeah, yeah. It's varsity rowing. Uh, that's what really? I was going to go with, and, and, then I and I really was not trying to throw you off because oh, you had you were you, you were heading that direction, mm-hmm. but you said something about the the, the trying out that, that I think was an important point to make. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 varsity rowing 
Uh, this is at Brown University. It was the str- oh, really the strongest could you have tribe given I've ever. Me, like it was at an Ivy League school. That yeah, I just want to. I just want to point out that I feel like you're. You know, I mean, it's just like Brown, and like you just had to compete for like the top boat. The top boat. Like, I mean, which I made. So like, no big deal. Like, I just. Wanna, can we have a moment? Can yeah. we have a moment for Craig? Craig is Pullman cool. Pride? We got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. we got it. Large okay. brained human. Yep. Super hoity toity. We got it. Sorry, sorry. All that <laughs> and bag of chips. Wow. I'm getting it from can I be both your, cameras can here. I, can I be your friend? Hey, Up for debate. Let's just get the colleagues thing down. So, um, yeah, it was, it, it was an all-consuming experience a lot of time together and actually it, and it was it was not it was kind of it was co-ed because we had some females who were coxswains and we also had the the women's team that trained out of the same boathouse so my, like my social circle oh, was, was like, like set. 80% in yeah. that See group. that's what I was thinking of but I was trying to go through that like the definition which meant it was all but anyway And here yeah. and here's a little a little backstory it it was so consuming in a mostly good way but but I kind of got burned out on it mm-hmm. at the end of my junior year. I still wanted to row. I still wanted to be part of the team, but I needed to set boundaries. And so my senior year, you know, I was all in, trained hard and everything, but I I spent less time with the team and mm-hmm. more time with other other people because I just I needed to have some boundaries. I needed to have some balance, I is the better way to put it. So and yeah. it, and it was a it was still a good experience, but that was an early lesson in how tribalism has this downside for me. Mm. Can Preach. I ask, how did you realize that you needed to have more balance? I, I just, That's I spent so much time thinking about mm-hmm. rowing. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it, a lot of success, but then the failures just, just consume me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I needed to have some other things to think about and occupy my time. Okay. I think yeah. that makes such a great point that people can get burnt out sucked dry what's the right word when we yeah. put too much into our tribes and we don't have balance i like the yeah, word that when, you used when there's all, yeah. yeah all that yeah. there is all right wait you got to give her points for your answer oh man well i'm just gonna say uh, you would have gotten 100 points to get it right but if you were close and you're you're almost there so i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you 75 points thank you I all appreciate right that. all right is producer brandon keeping track of the scores all right Give me the thumbs up. So 75 for fights. All right. Moving on, Craig, your turn. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are parts, these are communities that she's been a part of either in the past or currently. Okay. So um, fights has always been a part of a church or faith community. Um, She was a dancer as a child and still really loves theater Broadway. Um, She is currently a soccer mom and she is active in the St. Jude community. I'll add one quick caveat. So I danced all the way through college. Okay, that's good so to know. So there was periods of competitive dance. And then I will say, because I want to muddy the waters for you. <laughs> <laughs> muddy away. <laughs> muddy away. Um, that I was dance captain my senior year. I mean, guys. Respect. Right. No, please let's just, don't. It's, yeah. It was, I, please let me put it out there. I'm with, I was like, not cool people. No, 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 no. Let me no. just, no, 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 no. <laughs> Why am here's I Here's my only here? thing. Here's so here's what question. I find very interesting <laughs> is that the, I did not go to a school that had any sort of reputation, and it was very much extracurricular. It was not. It had zero to do with my major or anything like that. But for length of period of time that it was involved in my life, probably needed to give that caveat. May I ask clarifying questions? Sure. How many churches <laughs> have you? Oh my lord! Have to? I belonged to ballpark? Well, or can I? Can we go with attended? Because I have a little thing about membership. Okay. Um, attended more than once. I mean. It, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh man, I moved a lot as a child. Um, well, that's okay. Yeah, you don't have to count. So, so several during childhood. Several. I mean, I would say I have attended upwards of like. Ten. Were you within the same religion? Just oh yeah. So I mean, you. I would say I, I fall into that non-denominational Christian. So I have gone to churches that have a denomination to them, like mm-hmm. Baptist or uh, Evangelical Free or Presbyterian. But my parents always, you know, as a kid, they were sort of picking the churches. They always found a church where they felt like 
good teaching occurred that matched their theological beliefs, right? So, like, you know, denomination did not define why we went to a church. So Mm -hmm. when we would move to a new city, we would go to a couple different ones and then land on one based on matching of theological beliefs and the teaching that was coming from the big guy up front. Okay. Given all that information, I'm actually I'm going to rule that one out because I feel like if you're moving around that much from congregation to congregation, you you could still the religion could be a tribe, but I, I don't think that's going to have a strong enough hold. I'm also going to I'm I'm going to scratch soccer mom because you know we, we in our definition earlier we talked about the the tribes often have a leader or some sort of leadership or icon. And there's nothing. It's just a nebulous group. It's just a classification to me. And I don't think you're going to—I don't think you would like being known as a soccer mom. <laughs> All right, so that leaves me— As I chew on the side of my gonna, mouth. So that leaves me Dancer and St. Jude. And and I think your experience with St. Jude is extremely powerful, relatively recent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go—I'm going to say Dancer, number one. Hmm. What is so unbelievably hard for me about this is that, like— I wouldn't be able to answer this question. Like, I don't, I, when we had this conversation beforehand, and I think we're going to continue to talk about it, I have a really hard time with this idea of tribe. So what is the most meaningful to me as a human being is my faith, right? Like, that's the most personally meaningful to me, but I have a real beef with organized religion and some of organized religion, right? So then then I struggle with the idea of, like, that being my tribe. Your faith is important to my you, faith but not is extremely necessarily important the to me, tribe but, that's associated with it. Right. Like, does Jesus get to be in my tribe? Then I'm like, yes. But I, if if you said my tribe was the church that I currently attend, I would not. That would not be my tribe. Okay. So, so let's then scratch it's, that. Right. So okay. So you're gonna help her. I know Make you're gonna help me. Right. Like you're gonna get me to define my tribe. So I and lead her to dance. <laughs> cool. That's where this is going. Just heads up. But see, the funny thing is, is like I wouldn't like that means nothing to me now. I still love dance and and. Theater is one of my favorite things to go and do, but I'm like I'm but, not a dancer right now. But while now. you were there, like like I'm not on the rowing team anymore. Yeah, I guess but you would still. say. Well, and as you as the captain, or would were you the leader of that tribe? Capitan. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, I mean, yeah. Then I guess the answer would be dancer. Fair. Okay. <laughs> so Craig, do, 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 do. <laughs> you get a thousand points because you oh, just helped me figure yeah. out like if, if I was ever part of a tribe. Oh, well, but that, that was fair. like that. Yeah. Like you just so because I, I don't like this idea of tribe. Like I don't uh, I don't like it. Is but I any, guess that if I had been a part of one, that would be it. Anything you want to say about the St. Jude experience? Well, so what I was going to say is what would be the most meaningful to me right now would be that. Right. So our family is a part of the St. Jude's community. Our child receives treatment there. Right. And so that is a tribe that has a very exclusive group. That allows you to be a part of it. And I don't think anybody that's there would choose to be there. But the warmth and inclusiveness that happens when you're there, it's powerful, right? I feel so safe being a part of that community because of the way that they care for my child and our family. So, I mean, to me right now, if we talked meaningfulness outside of my faith, that would be it, right, Of, of something that I would be like, you know, I would wear a flag for that. Mm-hmm. Whoop, whoop. Well, so. I'm going to give you a bonus 500 points <laughs> for that. And, and, and one of the things that, from the outside looking in, it seems like that is a tribe that does not come with a negative baggage that we've already talked about with tribalism. Mm-hmm. That, but you correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't seem like that there's going to be any of looking at other tribes oh and looking down on them denigrating, dehumanizing, it's really about the support of the people within the tribe. Well, one of the remarkable things about St. Jude is that they share all of their research with anybody else. It is, you have, they are a research hospital, so you can't, they don't have like an emergency room. Like you can't roll up on St. Jude's with a broken foot and get an x-ray, right? They are a research hospital, and they share all of their research free, because it's rooted in the desire to eradicate pediatric cancer. 
right? So then they say, like, anybody and everybody is welcome, which to me, as we were talking fundamentally at the beginning about this idea that we can rid ourselves societally of unhealthy tribalism, like, what a remarkable example of what that would look like. Nobody technically wants to be a part of that crowd, yeah. but, like, you are welcome if if you need. And this has made me think uh, of a, 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 a distinction that I think is important. Tribe versus tribalism. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. being part of a tribe is not mm-hmm. necessarily a bad thing. In, in mm-hmm. this case, it's an entirely positive thing. Obviously, you don't want to be yeah, there, I, I, but, I, I, but once you. you're there, yeah, you're yeah, getting yeah. support. Whereas tribalism, which mm-hmm. has more about the dehumanizing and the, and the, the mm-hmm. looking down the mm-hmm. other and the exclusivity mm-hmm. and all that, that's, mm-hmm. that's where, that, where the pitfalls lie. Well, I think. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you just made a fantastic point, and a lot of it rooted in the idea of what is – what is the foundational point as to why you're a part of this group? Like, are you part of this group because you're looking to, like, safeguard yourself and you want to protect yourself from from bad, right? And I want to, I don't want to be seen as being connected to you, so I make myself part of this? Or is it a matter of here's where I find community that supports me in the current phase of life that I'm in, and then, but it, anybody is welcome to be a part of this group. There's no exclusivity to it. So, I mean, I think that that was sort of that. It's like, it's inclusive, Anybody can come and be a part. It's not exclusive, which says you can only be a part if. Yep. Oh, man, this was like... I was thinking about that. All right, guys, before I go, we have a bonus question. Mm-hmm. And our intern, Sarah Bradley, she conducted some in-depth research on other tribes within the world. And out of this list, you guys each must align with one community explain your reasoning as to why this community is the best tribe. And I... Be- best will, for, for us? For, I, for like, I think, yeah, like, so there are seven, just heads up. Seven are coming your way, and you're oh, going to pick which one is man. the best. Okay. And Bust the reasons my why. Pen for my old and then brain. I'm going to give you guys some points. Right. So just hold on. It's going to take a second. <laughs> so we got the bronies. So, bronies are a group of adult males who are fans of My Little Pony. Um, most notably, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. The Shout average, out Josh Jensen. The average age is a 21-year-old. Um, fights, you can still choose this one if it is speaking your name. If I'm really channeling my 21-year-old yep. male self. Exactly. Um, the next one is Vampires. So these are individuals who claim to be real vampires. So they hate garlic, they are super sensitive to light, and they drink blood. So, so I'm a little like, concerned like about like this. Legit, like legit. Like there's a group of humans that I ascribes that with this being, is real. Yes. Okay, non-judgmental thinking, non-judgmental stance. Yep. Okay, I'm, I'm here I'm for gonna it. I'm going to try to hold on to that throughout all my reading. Okay. Because, <laughs> okay. Um, they also hate Twilight because they just feel super misrepresented. So that's just a good, good thing Good reason. Know. Yeah, right. Robert Pattinson is an amazing actor. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. He's going to be Batman. <laughs> no, we, are oh, you yes, kidding me? Is. Like on purpose? Like somebody hired him to play that role? I don't understand. How do we go from Christian Bale to... Okay. Well, we, we, ben, ben Affleck is in between there. I mean, that's like, let's just not Dude, mention that. Michael Keaton. Okay, Val anyway. Kilmer. Anyway. So Keep going. There's other kin. So one word. So other kin believe that spiritually they are not human. Um, their spirit is either fights and going to need you to like not react because, okay. Um, either animal, plant, mythical being, or otherwise. I'm wondering what the otherwise category is. but And contrary to popular belief, other kin was not created over Tumblr. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Anyway, okay, next. Um, furries. So furries dress up as animals and participate in role-playing as their animal alter ego, um, also known as fursona. Okay. Fursona. Fursona. I'm starting to notice a trend, Craig, that these are all <laughs> going to be like right. significantly outside your and my general. So that's why it's going to be fun to see what you pick. So approximately 84% of furries identify, identify as male. So, Craig, this one might be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Then there are the doomsday preppers. So preppers are people who prepare for emergencies, such as disruptions in the political or social order, natural disasters, war, more. 
Um, they often develop sense. Uh, self-defense training, stockpile food, water, try to become self-sufficient. Um, this was an interesting fact. They have their own terminology, such as criminals are called goblins. What are called goblins? Criminals. Criminals are called goblins. Interesting. Okay. Um, adult, ba- adult babies. Um, these are individuals who role play um, a regression to infant-like state. So behavior may include drinking from a bottle, wearing a diaper. Um, There's a really amazing CSI episode. Oh, really? About a guy that dressed up as a little baby. Yeah, I feel like I've seen that pop up in uh-huh. different shows. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, the first public event for adult babies was called Baby Week, occurring in San Francisco in the early 1990s. Just a little trivia for you. And then finally, there. There's the nudist. So um, also called naturalism, nudists are people who practice, advocate, and defend nudity. Naturalism became a more widespread phenomenon in the 1920s in Europe, and then it kind of spread to the United States in the 30s. So which right. do you That's guys That's quite a list. Oh, my <laughs> That's Lord. quite a list. <laughs> I, and I'm like... Sarah Bradley, great work. Yes, seriously great work. And I'm over here stretching to try to find any aspect of self that I can describe. <laughs> so, so, uh, but so, I'm still not sure. Okay, so it's kind of... It's a little what, bit confusing. What, what, what would we belong to or just what we think is awesome? Let's... Um, or both. I think we need so to it's say like, which, which one group do you would you most pick? align with? Which would we, would we most align with? Yes. And why? Okay. Um, well, that's, okay, that's, hmm, hmm, mm-hmm. hmm, well, am I going first? <laughs> Dude, yes, because. You need some time? I, well. You're playing for time? I'm, I'm, and then Craig's just going to help you find your decision after. I know, I need you okay. to be my conscience. Keep going. Right. Okay, yeah. Well, there are a few of these that I just have to scratch right off, right? <laughs> I, the adult baby thing, that's just not me. And it's very similar to the nudist thing. Yeah. That's, you, know, yeah. I, you like I, clothes? I, yeah, exactly. I do. I like Standard. Clothes. Okay. Um, I never had an affinity for My Little Pony. Yeah. So I'm going to scratch that. The other kin, um, interesting, but and, – and I'm also – you know what popped into my head when you, when you were reading that was – um, Patronuses. Totally. Oh. And, I, so, and I'm in the middle, I'm reading Harry Potter for the second time. Because you're smart. So I'm going to asterisk that. I may come back to that. That's a good thought. I like that. Um, mm-hmm. The furries for Sona thing. No. <laughs> so I was really, it was kind of, as, as you're going through, I was, it was between vampires and doomsday preppers. <laughs> Which, Vamp- but then I got a vegetarian. Other kind of, that's you could sort of get choice. down with that. Well, well no, they to, drink that's blood. A, that is an excellent point. I'm going to scratch vampires. I love <laughs> vampire culture and, and, and uh, movies and books and stuff like that, but I'm going to scratch that. So that's between other kin and doomsday preppers. There's a lot of pragmatism about sure. the doomsday preppers, and I, I am, I'm concerned about the zombie apocalypse. It's coming. It's coming. Global warming is going to unleash a new wave of viruses. And Cue my and face. It's going It's <laughs> So... <laughs> I'm th- I'm leaning towards Doomsday Preppers, but no, I'm going to go with other kin. Okay, so because of the Patronus argument, yeah, spirit what's, animal. What's your, what's your spirit animal? Owl. Oh, That's my Patronus. Schmarf. Awesome. Is it really okay. going to be an owl? Mm-hmm. Okay. So funny as I as I was sitting here and actually thinking about this, my, the only one would have to be other kin because I am low key obsessed with elephants. Like, <laughs> right? Obsessed. My daughter's entire nursery was elephants. I I mean. I can see an elephant and immediately begin to cry because they are so unbelievably maternal. And I mean, oh, they are <laughs> intuitive <laughs> and brilliant and maternal and they're feminists. They can, and they can play music. They can. They have a fantastic sense of humor. They've discovered that elephants have a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they are fiercely loyal. My have very, very, sure, very you healthy sure body you images. Wouldn't choose furries then. Well, no, because I sure as tootin' <laughs> am not going to be dressing up <laughs> like an like anything. Yeah. But I would a hundred percent choose like if I believed in reincarnation, I would be so excited to come back as an elephant. Like, so we both picked other kids. Dope. I think my Patronus would be yeah. an elephant too. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would just like step on. Yeah. Things. Okay. So I'm gonna give Craig um, 500 points. Patron. I mean, I love Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Patronus. You nice. came up with that. Smartly idea. Smartly done. 
fights, um, I'll give you a solid 250. Sweet. Cool. I like it. Guys, well done. Thank you. You were the winner it, it, today. Mm-hmm. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yes. Craig. Craig has the tally. Craig, winner, winner, won. chicken dinner. And this one I'm not upset about. I Good. gleefully award you winner status for you today. You can see it. All right. Thank you. Good job, guys. And thank you, thank hey, you, Mara. That was awesome. Glad to be back. Go team. So, Fights, here's a story that I think a lot of people know loosely, but maybe, maybe not all the details. And I bet you learned about it like I did in Psych 101 when we were in college. All right. Oh, Lord. That it's was the blue a long time It's ago. the blue eye, brown eye exercise. Now, here are some details that not everybody knows. Jane Elliott was a school teacher, third grade teacher, and she came up with this exercise the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. And she did this um, to teach her kids about racism. Mm -hmm. So what she did is they they came in to to school, and she, she told them that all the kids who had blue eyes were superior. They were smarter better students, whatever, and all the kids with brown eyes were inferior. And she used, you know, de- developmentally appropriate language for this. And what was really powerful is that the kids owned that. They took that on. So the kids that had the blue eyes just started acting superior, and they started denigrating the kids with the brown eyes. And the kids with the brown eyes, they, you know, they fell victim to it. They, and, and they felt subjugated. And a lot of controversy about this because— you know, it was something that the kids did not ask. Mm-hmm. Well, they did and not sure know what they're getting in for. Effects. And I think the parents were, were not very happy about that. But it um, it, it was a seminal. We, so you, you you know about this story, yeah? So um, there's been some research into this, and there has been some some research that shows moderate results that an exercise like this reduces long term prejudice. But the findings are inconclusive about negative effects or, or harm versus, versus benefits. But that's just, to me, that's a really powerful story about how tribalism can just uh, erupt out of nothing mm-hmm. and have a very powerful effect on people. Oh, I mean, I think what's remarkable is, or, or, or you know, gut-wrenching and awful, but remarkable is that these these kids now granted part of it is that they were kids right so a little bit more um influential or influenced easily influenced right but that this group of people didn't go wait a minute that's not okay like you can't treat me like they immediately just absorbed like oh well then this is my reality right and i mean i think you know we have lots of examples throughout history where people bucked that like bucked what was sort of put on them you know i mean i'm thinking a lot about some of the um the underground cultures during World War II that really sort of fought back and like guerrilla warfare kinds of ways. But I think what's remarkable is that there is something, and I think it goes back to this hardwiring in our brain, that we are so hardwired to being part of a group that it takes some some real shifting from that like cave man lizard part of our brain up to like the fancy part of our brain to go, hang on, you can't put something on me. That I don't want you to, but that takes a lot of this part of, you know, the frontal lobe, the, that that fancy part of our brain to separate ourselves from that. And not everybody's got that ability to, A, think that they can, or B, how do I go ahead and do it? How do I break free of something like this? I mean, so it's interesting to me how we can both ascribe ourselves, like to, to make ourselves part of a tribe, but how quickly some of us will allow us to be, can I turn it into a verb, tribed? Like, I I put you into a group of humans? And we said this before. It's nature and nurture Mm -hmm. experience. And there's this great great quote from Tom Wolfe. A conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. A liberal is a conservative who's been arrested. So (sighs) life experience can really turn you in a certain direction and push you into a group. And then there are all sorts of qualities that keep you in that group. Well, and I mean, and I think, you know, knowing that the conversation that you and I had at the beginning about the idea of some of our own personal journey, if we're just talking about the tribe of politics, because I grew up, I mean, I would say that I probably grew up in a conservative home as well. I mean, you asked me about my political, right? But I would say probably we started out as conservative. And I think what's interesting is, is personally, I don't think I've abandoned all of that, right? I would still consider myself, um, 
to be grounded in, in, in some of that. Um, I think somebody once said to me, I'm, I'm financially conservative and socially liberal. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, I think some of that I still sort of hold true to, but that, that a hundred percent based on my ongoing interaction with human beings, that aspect of me has evolved. Well, he, he, okay. So here, here's another factor that has changed me. I, I, I said before that my, my views have changed mm-hmm. over time. Abortion. All right. I, for as long as I can remember, I, I would uh, I would be in the pro-choice camp. Just uh, I fundamentally feel like what happens to a woman's body should be should be her choice. But I got to tell you, becoming a parent, it didn't flip me on this issue, but it definitely changed how I think about it. Mm-hmm. Because when you're in the you know the 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 doctor's office and you see that heartbeat and you see you know your little human in in like when I in my wife's belly yeah it changes you're getting you emotional think. yeah it changes you're how you emotional. think about this issue and for, for me it, it now it didn't flip me I'm still pro choice but but I have well first of all I appreciate more deeply <sighs> where pro lifers are coming from mm-hmm. and it's also got me thinking about. You know, what's the common ground? Like there, there are certain instances where, of course, like abortion can't be the answer. Like, like, like late term, like mm-hmm. almost everybody agrees that that's we can't be doing that unless the, you know, unless right, the right, 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 life right, is right. at stake. Right. Um, but boy, early on. It, it, but I think one of the things that you're highlighting is you cannot just look at like one tiny little piece of it. Because if you said to me, you only get to make the decision about your stance on this based on your ability to either say you can have access to making decisions about my own body or you can't, what is my as a woman's visual reaction to that going to be? You can't tell me what to do with my own body. But when you see it as a global picture, like I think my best friend once summed it up really acutely is like, okay, well, what voice does the child have? Because if it's life, if there is life, then it has right, right? Like, so it's like, okay, well, then who's advocating for the child? And I mean, this is such difficult subject matter. But when you talk about, if we're, you know, if we pull back the lens and we're talking about tribalism, what happens is we get too, I think, singularly focused on one thing, which you just highlighted beautifully. I think this idea that, like, you can't look at the subject matter of abortion through one lens. Now, you may have to land someplace and say, okay, so I go through all the back and forth and here's where I land. But I think we dangerously sometimes are myopic about how we choose to to put ourselves into tribes or how we talk about certain subjects, whether it be abortion, whether it be LGBTQ rights, whether it be immigration, whether it be, I mean, there's all of these things um, that, that people can get really, I think, to myopic about. And usually, I mean, I don't know if we've got the time for it today, but I think Brene Brown in her book, Braving the Wilderness, does this beautiful job of trying to draw attention to this subject and the idea of aligning ourselves via hate or our differences, which that goes to that exclusion, right? Versus aligning ourselves in unity or in, in, so what would be the opposite of hate? So love, I mean, it's not the opposite of hate. But, but you know, I mean, I think that's where the pendulum may swing. But I think people have to be willing to pull the lens back and to have that perspective taking that you talked about earlier and that ability to go, okay, what's all of the points to this? And, yeah, we got you, you got to have values, right, which means you make a decision somewhere along these – on a line, right, but that – the ability to be connected to another human being means I'm willing to see things from your perspective and validate, right? Because validation does not equal agreement. So just because right. I'm willing to see your perspective doesn't mean I have to agree with you. But if I want to try to fight this idea that you and I cannot walk alongside each other in life and be harmonious means that I have to be willing to go, oh, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. So I'm curious, do you help people with tribalism in your therapy practice? Oh, yeah. I mean, what, I th- what are a couple examples of how, like, <sighs> so, do, do, are people coming? I would imagine, I would assume that people aren't coming to you, and that's, that's the, um, 
That's the referral question. I need help with my tribalism. It probably just it sort of it comes mm-hmm. out. I think the biggest thing that I see is the ability for people to embrace non-judgmental thinking, right? And so to expand a little bit of that. I do have I do have people that come to me being a trauma therapist, I will have people walk through my door that are often struggling with either their faith or their family of origin based on some sort of traumatic circumstance that has happened to them, right? So this terrible thing happened to me, and it has created this emotional or cognitive divide between myself and my family or myself and my faith, right? But where I would actually see the greatest work that I do is parents in their parenting with their children. So parent as in, I'm the authority figure, I'm right, you do as I say, kid, you are you know, my subject, you are to be controlled, you don't get to have values or thoughts until what, we're magically turn 18. So I think that's where I do the greatest work of like, okay, what does it look like to be willing to be perspective taking? What does it look like to be validating? What does it look like to stop? And it doesn't mean you abandon, what are your values or what you think is right or wrong for your child, but are you willing to listen? So how do you move people along that? How do you, how, how do you, how do you get people on that journey? Less judgmental thinking, better perspective taking. I think some of it, especially for parents, is like, how would you feel if? Or it's dangling that carrot out at the end of saying, what do you want your relationship to look like with your child? And most people are going to say to me, like, I want to have a good relationship with my kid, or I want to be connected by with my kid, or I want my kid to trust me. And it's like, okay, well, if you want that to happen, this whole idea that rules or restrictions are more important than relationship, you're not going to get there. And so then I think the biggest struggle is going, okay, well, then how can, you know. That's, that's like the motivation. Right. Like teaching this idea that validating or being perspective taking does not mean that you abandon your values or it does not equal agreement. And, and I would say to people, I, I personally would say that I am way more willing to, to take my punishment or be put in my place or hear the word no if I feel like I've been heard. Right. So, so, so now, you know, I'm going to say this to parents and say, like, okay, so now put yourself in your child's shoes. Like they're going to, and, and we know research supports that kids are way more likely to not only accept the consequences that they've been given, but willing to follow through, right? Like, yes, I accept that you've grounded me and I'm not going to buck that if they feel like they've been heard. Right. So it's like, okay, well then what does that say? That as long as a person feels like that you have not stolen their voice or put them into a place where they are, they have no um, n- no right to sort of share their side of the story, then most times people are more cooperative, more willing to hang in there, right? So, I mean, I think, you know, daily sort of where does the rubber hit the road, that would be the greatest place where I would see that happening. But every once in a while I have people come in and we have to have some hard conversations about what is non-judgmental thinking look like and the way that maybe being too narrow-minded or judgmental is impacting their ability to be in connection with other human beings. All right, so let, let's refine this discussion a little bit. So we, we've already established that tribes can be good, mm-hmm. they all, but they can be negative when they're driven by tribalism, right. which yep, is more like about uh, exclusivity and dehumanizing, denigrating others. So we've come up with a list of six, and I, I can't count, eight. I was going to say... <laughs> Okay, Here, old so man. <laughs> here's some eight tips. <laughs> no, two are bonus. We started with six. Two for free. So right eight, a total of eight tips to to combat tribalism. Right on. So right. first being ask yourself what makes you an individual. So what makes you you? What makes you special? What makes you unique? And that's and that's important because even if you belong to a tribe, Mm -hmm. you're different from the other people Mm -hmm. in the tribe. Mm -hmm. And if you can appreciate that, then you can appreciate that there are differences in the people in other tribes. That it's not just, you're not looking at a group as this block. No. We do not become two-dimensional. You do not lose your individuality. It's a step towards appreciating nuance and respecting it. Mm. Oh, good word. So... And that leads right, a lot of these overlap. That right, leads right into the second tip, which is to embrace a level of skepticism. And what we mean by that is skepticism about other thoughts and viewpoints, but your own as well. So um, being willing to question your belief about something or 
your your attitude, um, what you consider to be right or wrong, and and consider the possibility that maybe you're maybe you're wrong, or maybe you're right and the other group is right as well. Mm-hmm. Or maybe there could be room for both. Mm-hmm. So the skepticism mm-hmm. takes a lot of forms. Well, the, the way that I would describe this, and I say this a lot of times in my office, is you know, be willing to ask questions, be willing to ask open-ended questions, like and and never lose that. And that I really feel like that willingness, that ability to continuously ask open-ended questions, is what allows us to be more evolutionary, right? Because things change, things shift. You know, I ask my husband different questions fifteen years in than I did day one. And I hope that those conversations and questions will look different 15 years from now. I have conversation with my nine-year-old different than I have conversation with my five-year-old different than I would have had conversation with them when they're two, right? So that willingness to ask open-ended questions, I think is a great way to walk that out. Excellent. Um, Expose yourself to contradictory ideas, which I think tags on to that be curious, Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, that's, I see that as just as an extension of the skepticism. One of my favorite, I, I follow politics extensively. And one of my favorite how shows. Depressing. What's that? I said, how it, depressing. It can be. It can be. But one of my favorite shows is Morning Joe. Mm. It's on MSNBC and uh, we'll have it on at home, but also it's, you know, it's podcasted so I can, I can listen to it in the car. The reason I like it is that. There is a spectrum of views. I, mm. I know MSNBC gets slammed for being liberal or progressive, but that, but, but I think across the board, that's a portfolio of viewpoints. And that show, you've got Joe Scarborough, who is, uh, well, I think he's an independent now, but he was a Republican congressman. Um, uh, Mika, I, how do you say her last name? You got uh, me. Brzezinski, something okay. like that. Oh, I just totally hacked that. Um, she is liberal. Okay. But then the guests that they have, they have people who are clearly neutral, mm. but then they have people on board who are Republican strategists, they have Democratic strategists, mm. they have, and the guests, they have people from both sides of the aisle. I, I feel like when I watch and listen to that show, I get a good taste of varied viewpoints. So um, that, that's a, a place where I get my diet of contradictory ideas. Okay. All right. So number four, um, practice theory of mind. And theory of mind is this phenomenon of being able to take the perspective of another person. Mm -hmm. And this is, okay, for me, let let me give an example of that. I I, I was being a a liberal Democrat. I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016. Color me surprised. And and I was very frustrated by the results of that election. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that I grappled with it was I, I... I worked hard to put myself in the place of mm. various Trump voters, and and this is going to get into the next tip here, the, the fifth tip here, but um, I really asked myself the question, the opening question, why would someone have voted for Trump? Mm-hmm. And what I realized that there were multiple answers to yeah. that question. Yeah. So cue up number well, five. Well, so then number five being acknowledge diversity within groups. And I mean, I think... I, can I can I have another moment of pride? Like I'm so proud of you that that is the stance that you took, and I don't mean that condescendingly, right? But that ability to go, wow, other people can be different, other people can have different views, um, that and that I'm not right. Different doesn't equal wrong. If you handed me, I remember being so excited every year. I would get a 64 box of crayons, right? Which I was like. I'm With definitely part of the, the yeah, definitely part of the cool crowd because I got 64. If I had opened that box and there was only red crayons, I mean, devastated I would have been. Oh, look at my Yoda moment. <laughs> devastated I would have been. <laughs> um, but I think there that that is what makes. I think that is what has allowed us to survive. Truly, I don't mean that melodramatically. As like a human species, is diversity matters. And so that ability to embrace that and to not see it as a negative, but I think that that can make people scared, right? Like diversity scares people. And and so going my processing real quick of the 2016 election, I realized that there are people who voted for Trump because they could not stand Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. A lot of scar tissue there. There are people who voted for him. Um, entirely because they wanted uh, 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 conservative Supreme Court justices mm-hmm, to mm-hmm, be nominated. Mm-hmm. Their people voted for him because they were scared of economic change. Mm-hmm. 
there were people who voted for him because he feels like they felt like he embodies a white supremacy, Mm -hmm. uh, there's a prejudice. Mm -hmm. And so not lumping all the Trump voters into one bucket Mm -hmm. helped me appreciate the the nuance. And and, uh, and we just Mm -hmm. have to do that on both sides of the Mm -hmm. political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which then leads into what you just, you know, what you were just highlighting the next one. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're up to number six now? Yeah, Yeah. go. So number six is to tackle groupthink head on. Mm-hmm. And groupthink, as we've already learned about uh, during the breakaways of this episode, it's this tendency for groups to, or individuals within the groups, to influence each other's thinking to the point where there's no diverse thought, there's no diverse problem solving. It's it's kind of like collective freight train brain towards one outcome, and it can lead to really bad decisions being made with not all perspectives being appreciated. Um, not all options being considered. Mm-hmm. And so uh, very, uh, a, a very basic tip for, for groupthink is just talking about it. Mm-hmm. So at the outset of a, of a problem-solving session with a group saying, hey, we have to avoid groupthink. Mm-hmm. And so having time where there's honest brainstorming, authentic brainstorming, mm-hmm. um, where ideas are tossed out and not judged. And then there's, you know, there's an evaluation process towards the end or after the brainstorming. And then intentionally having someone be the devil's advocate to pose the questions, the open-ended questions about each option. So there are ways, but just acknowledging groupthink and taking taking it on really does matter. Uh, Number seven, and this this uh, I got this from Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy and the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, is to get proximate. All right, and 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 what what he talks about, what he means there is. If you want to understand an issue, you have to get proximate. You have to get next to the people who represent other ideas, other experiences, mm. um, other regions of the country that can take the pla- that can take the form of traveling, that can p- take the place of sitting down and having conversations with people, um, reading, watching. But you have to get next to people who are not like you. I cannot plug enough Brene Brown's book *Braving the Wilderness* as just well it's remarkably well written and and i think speaks to so much of what we're talking about today but she and i don't i I may butcher this quote so uh, you know i apologize to all the Brene browners out there um but i think it says it's hard to hate somebody up close Mm. um and this idea of when we get in you know when we get into community with people like it's really hard if i'm willing to just you know, be in your circle and ask questions, it's hard for me to then, you know, draw those divisive lines. I mean, I could go off on that subject matter alone for hours. But I mean, I think that there's there's so much to that idea of I can easily hate you from far away because I can put a label on you and I can just say, oh, there's Craig, the liberal Democrat. And then that means all of these things about him. But when I sit across the table from Craig Pullman and get to know him and and his boys and and the things that make his heart tick and and why you got emotional talking about watching one of your sons and Jen's bellies. It's like, okay, well, you become so much more than a liberal Democrat. You become a human being with nuance and and with a wide range of experiences and hurts and those hills and valleys, right? I mean, and I think that there's so much to that as being maybe that anecdote to the poison that's currently in our society that is just dividing us in dangerous ways. Which leads to our eighth tip. Focus on what is shared. So the 80-20 rule and the power of the allowed extremes. So, I mean, I think um, we are going to be able to build so much better community if I focus on what we have in common as as opposed to focusing on what divides us. And and it's... it's a cliche, right? That there's mm. that what you just said, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not a politician, but I got to tell you, like, I, I think I'd be a pretty good negotiator if I was in the political realm because mm-hmm. what I would do if you have got two sides of an issue is I'd first generate a list of what do we both want, what do we, what do we agree on, what do we both mm-hmm. want, or have the two lists, and then there's there's the vast majority of the time there's a huge amount of overlap. And I'll take gun control for an example. Oh, Lord. All right? Really, Craig? I'm already sweating over here. But there, there is so much. So oh, many yeah. people in this country agree on a, like a litany of initiatives for gun control. Mm-hmm. It's just so the 80-20 rule, 80% of the noise 
about guns is generated by 20%, yep. like 10% on either mm-hmm. side of the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. So the, the 10% of the people who want no guns at all mm-hmm. and the 10% of the people who want guns everywhere are ruling our discourse, whereas 80% in the middle agree on almost everything. Mm-hmm. And so if we appreciate that f- focus on that, we can deal with the stuff on the fringes mm-hmm. if we have solidarity around the huge amount that we agree on. Mm. Such good conversation. And I think the idea that it is going to require like a cognitive shift, though. Um, I was working with a family on some co-parenting stuff. They're in the the beginning stages of separation and divorce. And I said, it's so hard as adults to completely shift the way that we think about things. Right. But that ability to shift perspective is going to be, I think, the thing that allows us to solve a lot of this problem. Like, can I shift from saying that what makes me have community is what divides me from you and makes me different? Or can I shift it and say, here's what we have in common. Here's what allows me to connect to you. Here's what will be allow me to reach out my hand and help, as opposed to the thing that would make me turn my back and walk away. Eliza and Ben worried that an actual physical fight may break out at their wedding reception. So they decided to address the situation head on. They spoke to their immediate families as a couple and gently requested that the focus of the day be on what brought them all together as opposed to what made them different. They went so far as to post signs at the reception reminding guests that it was Eliza and Ben's moment and that unity and not taking sides was the order of the day. The night went off without a hitch, political or otherwise. No crossfire-style arguments, no mudslinging. And if you were paying close attention, the quote-unquote red and blue states shared the dance floor, toasting the happy couple and genuinely enjoying one another. Ren Engage is our producer. Sean Beck is our sound engineer, theme music composer, and video editor. Executive producers are Dave Hagen and Frank Askell. Contributors this episode were Mara Teal and Dave Hagen. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, psychbytes.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbytes. You can also reach us via email, podcast at psychbytes.com. Please send us questions, thoughts, and suggestions for show topics. We are available just about anywhere you find your podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Please spread the word and subscribe. Your positive ratings and reviews really help us build our audience. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Bites Podcast. Podcast.